I'm your host, Dr. David Bertone. This is our first uh, COVID-related TV show in which we have um, uh, stopped uh, recording in the studio and we're going to do a uh, virtual TV show. So it's, it's really exciting that I'm having as our guest today, Joy Michelle Johnson. Uh, Joy Michelle has been a patient of mine um, for a while after uh, having a motor vehicle accident and undergoing um, surgery on her neck, which we're going to talk about extensively. But really the topic for the show today is that she is a yoga instructor now and really runs a fantastic class online uh, in a Zoom format. And I thought it would be interesting to hear from her, hear about her history, and then she can demonstrate some of the interesting things that she does in yoga and how it's been able to um, help her body recover from not only uh, neck surgery, uh, but from prior uh, lumbar or low back fusion. And um, so at this, at this point, I'm going to introduce uh, Joy Michelle. Joy, welcome to You and Your Health. Hi, <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you. So um, let's go over your background a little bit about your your medical history. So it, it all started with a, with a car accident, correctly? Correct? Well, for my neck, it did. It started okay. with a car accident, but I had had um, a congenital defect in my low back and I started having symptoms as a late teen. Oh, and, that's um, right, yep. Yes, yeah, so I had symptoms in my low back into my legs and I was a competitive swimmer in college and was experiencing problems. And, um, you know, fast forward 10 years after that and I had my fusion surgery. Okay. And, um, you know, all through my thirties, I'm in my forties now, was recovering and building my strength back from that and then had a, a car accident um, a couple years ago. So the, the surgery on your low back, I think was in 2008, correct? Yeah, I, I had one in 2007, one in 2008, and then okay. a year after that in 2009, I had a spinal cord stimulator implanted and have had a couple variations of that since. Yeah, so you were dealing with chronic pain in your low back for a long time. For a very long time and, and definitely affecting my legs. Um, I have a lot of nerve pain, particularly in my right leg, and without that spinal cord stimulator, it's very painful. Okay. So then um, you came to me after having a, well, surgery on your neck, but the motor vehicle accident was in 2018, I believe, correct? Yes, yeah. And yes, I was actually leaving teaching a yoga class when I got rear-ended. <laughs> ah. <laughs> so you were rear-ended when you were you uh, stopped and somebody hit you. Yes. And you immediately developed significant neck and arm pain, correct? Yes, uh, right away, it was awful. It, it was yeah. burning. It was awful. I couldn't turn my head fully. And then at some point wasn't even able to lift my arm fully. Okay. So then prior to surgery, you underwent some conservative care, right? Chiropractic, uh, uh, epidural injections, some of the standard yeah. stuff. Yeah, all the standard stuff. <laughs> yeah. and, you, and you didn't respond. So then eventually you had uh, disc replacement surgery, correct? Yes. I yeah. Did. So that's, that's pretty exciting because um, it was actually, I think your neck was probably the first disc replacement that I rehabbed. And, and oh, wow. Practice. <laughs> so it was, it, was really, it was really cool at that time. And I'm just popping up your x-rays at this point so everybody can see it. Yeah. Um, that, so the neurosurgeon implanted this artificial disc um, into the C5, C6 level, I believe. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And so um, you can see by that it just increased the space that was there, uh, that should be there, that was compressed during the trauma. And um, how is your neck doing now? So overall, it's doing pretty well. And the thing that was important to me about wanting to have the disc replacement as opposed to a fusion, and I was thankful that I was a candidate for that, Mm -hmm. um, was to really maintain more mobility than I would have had if I had a fusion. Correct. Um, yeah. you know, so that was really important to me. I wanted to maintain as much movement as I could. Um, and I'm doing overall pretty well. I get some spasms. I get like muscle spasms in and around my throat, which is a little strange. Yeah. Um, and I still get some burning pain that comes and goes up into the back of my shoulder and the back of my neck. Um, but I know a lot of actually things that I learned in therapy um, that I do that really help ease it, um, you know, so that it doesn't become that sort of chronic nonstop, 
feeling. Yeah, um, yeah. But there's a lot of stretches and a lot of strengthening moves that I do that actually help ease it. So um, your your rehab in our practice was about 11 months. It was pretty extensive. It was and, long. <laughs> yeah, it was long. And to be build back all those muscles and, and the mobility. Um, so you've done really well. And that's why I was so excited to introduce you to the show when I when it really came to me when you started doing the, the headstands on, on Facebook. <laughs> and, and I said, wow, she's really doing fantastic. And I think it's time to uh, introduce what she's doing to the uh, to the community. So um, how long have you been how long have you been doing yoga? And give us a little history about that. So I, I actually started practicing yoga about 21 years ago. Um, okay. And I was already having back problems at the time. And it had been recommended to me. And it was something that I could do anywhere. You didn't really need any special equipment. I didn't need a gym. You know, I would attend classes, but I could practice at home. So I've had a really consistent home practice for at least 20 years, which I think is a big difference too. Um, and it's just something that felt very good in my body. And I was able to move in ways that made sense for me that I felt that I could you know, control the movement and not strain myself. And it really taught me a lot about movement and how to move better, um, which I think was, was really the most important thing for me. Yeah, and the other interesting now, especially interesting thing, especially now during COVID, is that more people are exercising at home. Yeah, right? they're not going to gyms, and you've started doing uh, Zoom classes online. Yeah, teaching I, people about yoga. So tell us about that, and how's that going? Yeah, so I, I got certified as a yoga teacher um, probably a little over three years ago, and I did 500 hours in training, and I was teaching live classes when COVID hit. Yeah. And, you know, the studios were shut down and my, one of my studios, actually, we decided to shut down before the actual shutdown okay. just for safety. Um, and we all kind of made a decision of who was going to teach online. And I said, you know what, let me do it because I know how important my practice is for me um, to feel good in my body. And I know a lot of my students really enjoy feeling that, you know, after a class. Um, and I said, if I can offer it, why not? And yeah. um, I've been teaching online a few days a week. and you know, it's different. It's definitely a different um, approach. I don't get to interact with my students in the same way as you can imagine. Yeah. But I know, you know, from being a physical therapist, you know, what you do is very hands-on. And while I'm not necessarily hands-on in that way, um, I, I would certainly be making suggestions and, yeah, yeah. you know, things for my students to try differently because I can see what's happening in their body. Um, so I've lost some of that. But really the practice of yoga is a self-study and a self-exploration of movement. So it works, you know, you have to honor your own body. So I always give those instructions. You know, if I give an instruction and it doesn't feel right for you, then you don't do that. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, you yeah. need to bring your knees down if we're, you know, on our hands and our feet and you need to bring your knees down, then you bring your knees down. Yeah. Um, so in a way, I think it's given people more ownership of their practice. Now, now, uh, do you have different levels of classes that you teach, like a beginner? Like if I've never done yoga before, are you going to mix me with people that are advanced or how does that work? So um, there are beginner classes and I have taught them. My classes right now are mixed level. So I do like my students to let me know, hey, I'm a brand new beginner. I've never done this before because then I will give more options. Um, but I tend to give options in my instruction all throughout. Um, okay. One of the nice things about in an odd way, the positive things that come out of having gone through back surgeries and neck surgery is that I kept moving through all of it. Yeah. And so yeah. I really learned some options that you can do when your motion is restricted. Yeah. And I'm able to share those. You know, I have yeah. a student right now with, you know, a neck injury going on. And I will tell her, I'm going to ask you not to put weight in your hands. You know, I'm going to ask you not to, you know, go into what we call downward facing dog. It's this inverted V shape. And I'll say to her, I don't think that that's going to serve you well right now. You know, you're free to try it, but try with your knees down and just extend your arms out in front of you and keep the weight in your legs so that you're not putting pressure on your neck. Good. And good. so I try to think of those options to give to people. Yeah, I think as a, as a physical therapist, obviously, we're, we promote movement our, our whole life. Uh, that's really what we do. And, and this combination of, you know, yoga is movement, but there's also some meditation involved, right, and mindfulness. Yeah which I think is really important these days with what's going on and stress level that people are having. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm hoping you can 
talk a little bit about that when when we start demonstrating some of the movements. Um, <laughs> I think it's also interesting for people to know that you are a practicing attorney. So in, yes. your, in your real job, you are an attorney, and um, so this is more of a more of a hobby. But I know it's something you have a lot of passion for, and uh, we're excited that you can demonstrate it for us. Um, yes. so, so when you're when you're doing when when you're teaching the yoga, um, do you go over uh, just some basic concepts? with people like what what they should feel or soreness levels or things like that i try because i'm not in the medical field i try yep. not to tell people what they should be feeling i will often say things like you might feel a sensation you know say there's a pose that we take um called pigeon pose where you really are getting into the outer hip and the inner groin and i'll i'll say you may feel a sensation in the outer hip. If that becomes too intense, I'm gonna ask you to engage your muscles and I'll explain how to do it. Um, but I try not to tell them what they should feel because every single human body is completely different. Our range of motions are different. Yeah. You know, Our limb lengths are different. Our joints are different. So what I may be feeling may not be at all what somebody else is feeling in a particular pose. So I really try not to tell them what they should be feeling, but I try to talk about what muscles we're engaging um, I talk with very generic terms. I try not to get too technical, sure. um, you know, because that just would go over most people's heads. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and then they'll be thinking more than experience. Good. Um, so I, I do try to give some information though. Great. So I think when we come back from the break, we're, we're going to change your we're going to change your setup so you can demonstrate a lot of these <laughs> poses. And I'll ask some questions while you're doing it. So when we when we come back, we're gonna we're gonna demonstrate some of the yoga poses and ask Joy Michelle some more questions about her um, yoga experience. So right. we'll be right back. COVID nineteen is on the rise. It's more important now than ever to follow strict guidelines. Protect yourself and loved ones. Always wear a mask in public. Wash your hands frequently. Maintain a safe distance of at least six feet from others and work with contract tracers. It's also helpful to get your flu shot this year. Together, we can stop the spread of COVID-19. For more information, visit MiddlesexCountyNJ.gov slash COVID-19. Start a story. Adopt at the shelterpetproject.org. Fast-paced family life in need of a slowdown? Hello, I'm Dr. Spruce. Did you know all those green shapes on maps are parks and forests? It's true. Visit discovertheforest.org and plan to visit a park or forest near you instead of just wondering what it would have been like. While the word forest might make you think of distant lands from far, far away, please note parks and forests are closer than you think which means things like beautiful scenery, fresh air, and family time are also closer than you think. Hi, welcome back to You and Your Health. I'm your host, Dr. David Bertone. Today, we're talking with Joy Michelle Johnson, who's a yoga instructor, um, who has a history of um, neck, disc replacement and low back spinal fusion. And she's been able to uh, resume her active career as a yoga instructor um, by continuing these movements and completing her program in uh, physical therapy. So Joy Michelle, welcome back to the show. And uh, we're excited to see some of the yoga poses. 
So take yeah. us through, take us through um, what you're going to be showing the audience. Sure. So most classes we do start seated, but I'm going to take you through what's called a sun salutation. It's a very simple flow of movements that's going to get you from standing to down on the ground and back to standing. Right. Um, and I will narrate as I'm moving through it and, and try to explain some variations that I include because I've had to use them before. Um, so we always start standing and it's called Tadasana or mountain pose and your feet are hip distance apart. And I turn my hands to face forward. That gives you an open chest and draws your shoulder blades back. And the first movement is an inhale up and we reach the arms overhead. And then as we exhale, we're going to fold forward. Now, hinging at the hips is really difficult for a lot of people, especially if you've had low back injury or if you have tight hamstrings or even just tight paraspinal muscles. So an option that I give is as we inhale, we start to fold forward, but then I'm going to bend my knees as I fold all the way forward and let my fingertips come down. And it's important to let the crown of the head come down so I'm not reaching my head forward and straining my neck. The next move would be an inhale and we halfway lift. This is where you can work on straightening the legs and straightening the back. And then as we exhale, I bend the knees again to come into that forward fold. And I'll bring my fingertips to the ground and we'll step back to a plank pose. So I plant my hands and step one foot back and then the other. From here, there's two options. So the more advanced would be to lower to a push up. That's not available to everyone. For most people, it's not. So what I have people do is bring their knees down. And then from the knees down position, I have them shift their weight forward and then lower with control to the best of their ability all the way down. So from there, the next movement would be either an upward facing dog, which I'll show in a moment, or cobra, it's a back bend. So I keep my hands on the floor and I inhale and I lengthen the crown of my head forward and draw my shoulder blades back. My feet stay on the floor. It doesn't have to be that high, it could be here. And then on an exhale, I'll lower all the way down. The more advanced option that I've worked up to is to come into upward facing dog where the arms are straight and I'm on the top of my feet, my legs are engaged. So those are the two back bends you'll come into. What I typically take people into next is a tabletop. So you'll press the ground away and come onto hands and knees. This is usually more accessible for most people because what would often happen is we'll come from upward facing and then right to downward facing. Mm. So that's really challenging for a lot of people. So coming from hands and knees is much easier to curl the toes under, lift your hips and come into what we call downward facing dog. So this is also pretty challenging for a lot of people, especially if you have tight hamstrings or a tight back. So I tell people to come up on their toes bend your knees and reach your hips away. The other option I give is to walk your hands forward and keep the knees down. Now, Joe, how long do you typically hold these poses for? So that's dependent, um, depending on the class. We try with what's called vinyasa or a flow class to do one breath per movement, but there's also times where we hold them. So for example, we hold downward facing dogs sometimes for five breaths. Now, this can be really challenging on the shoulders. And if you've got anything going on with the neck, that can be super challenging to hold. Mm -hmm. So what I do is tell people to take this other option, stay on your knees, walk your hands forward. Now the weight is in my legs and I'm still getting the extension and the length in my back and my arms and I'm getting the range of motion in my shoulders, but I'm not putting the weight or the strain on my neck. Yeah, that pose, that particular pose is awesome to get that extension of your mid-back, which is a big problem area we see in physical therapy from people at computers all day long, right? Yeah, so like that whole thoracic region tends to be the tightest area for people mm -hmm. that I yep. see when they try to take, so I'll take downward facing dog again. So what I see is people who can't get their legs straight or get their chest back toward their thighs is more rounding. I don't know if you could see that. Yes, But they're yes. kind of stuck here. Yep. And so bending the knees gets them to get the hips up a little bit higher. Yep. And then you can work on extending. Yeah. So people at home can see how straight your spine gets there, which is, which is <laughs> really, really phenomenal. It, it's taken a lot of work. So the last thing for that entire flow would be to come from downward facing dog back to standing. And the best way that I can explain doing it is to come up on your toes and bend the knees. That's gonna take some of the strain out of the low back, especially if you're tight there. 
and then start to tiptoe your feet forward. For most people, they need to come up on fingertips at this point and maybe walk the hands back to the feet and the feet forward. But the idea is that we're trying to keep the abdominal muscles working. So I'm walking my feet forward and then I'll come into that forward fold and again, keep the knees bent and then half lift because we do a lot of repetition and fold and we come right back to our starting position. Great. So that's a pretty, pretty typical um, pattern of movement that we do in most classes um, that I've experienced. But the, a lot of the poses can be really challenging, especially for a beginner. So having some options of bending the knees or lowering the knees can be really important. Now, how long is a typical class that you run? So my classes are usually an hour and that's pretty standard for a lot of studios. Some are like 45 minutes. To me, if it's like a half hour, you're not getting much out of it. By yep. the time you've warmed up your body, it's like, it's done. <laughs> And so what, what, what type of warm-up do you do? Do you just go right into those poses or do you do some other type of active warm-up? So I start, I usually start my classes seated at, or on our back and we'll do some gentle movement and just start linking movement to breath. So even if it's just arms lifting and we'll just start focusing on linking the movement to breath. And then I usually come up to stand and we'll do a flow. Um, and then there's a lot, there's a lot more poses that we filter into that because the class is an hour. And then we tend to wind down toward the end, come down on our back. We'll do some spinal twists, knees into the chest, really start to just sort of down regulate the whole body. Um, and then we'll come into usually five to 10 minutes of final relaxation where you just breathe. <laughs> okay. Why don't you show us a couple of more like advanced poses and things okay. that, um, Maybe not so much for beginners, but that you've been able to uh, perform because of all your hard work and getting your spine with such mobility and stability at the same time. That's the thing people don't understand. Your spine needs to be mobile, but it needs to be stable. So yeah. if, you, if you have too much mobility, that causes problems. And if it's too rigid, that causes problems. So having that balance between mobility and strength is really the best way to uh, prevent injury going forward or even reduce pain associated with what we call a hypermobile spine. Yeah. So one of the things I teach is core strength class um, where I very much focus on stability. You know, we call it core strength because everybody understands that. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm going to show you is an arm balance pose. Um, I think you'll be able to see it pretty clearly. So I start from that downward facing dog position and I'll show you sort of like the setup to get into it. So you shift forward and I lift one knee and I'm bringing it out toward my elbow. Now that might be how I just teach somebody just learning the pose. Mm -hmm. But then what I do is I come forward, I bring that knee to the elbow, bend my elbows, extend the legs. Wow. And then lift the wow. So that's gotta be pretty advanced for somebody to be able to do that. Yeah, or you have to have been a gymnast. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's a super advanced pose. But the reason I wanted to show it is there's also, so I always tell everyone there's always some place to go in yoga. So for some people, this might just be the practice of just getting the knee toward the elbow. Mm -hmm. And maybe we just work here and we do each side. And that's a step or a process to get into that pose. Great. Um, any other advanced poses? Um, we have. <laughs> Uh, you want, maybe we'll save the, the famous headstand to the end, but any, any other advanced ones before then? Yeah, so they're, they're advanced is varying. What I, what I would say too is one of the things we do a lot of in yoga is work on balance. And balance is so important, especially through the aging process, because I think it's one of the things we lose quickest. Yes. So anything where we're standing on one foot or the other and we're shifting our weight can feel pretty advanced to somebody who's not used to doing it. So one pose that I often teach and I teach it to beginners up through advanced would be tree pose. Um, it's a one leg balance. So I'll teach it in variations where you bend your knee and you turn your knee out and my toe is still on the ground. So I'm balancing on one leg, but I've got a little bit of a kickstand. But then to advance it, you could bring the foot onto the shin. And so not huge compression anywhere, you know, not big flexion in the knee. But then more advanced is to bring it up onto the inner thigh and then hold in stillness. 
and then I'll reach the arms up overhead. So I'm getting a lot of extension through my back. My standing leg is really activated. And then I can add the more advanced option is to start moving the spine in lateral motion. Yeah, it's an amazing amount of stability. I mean, you're not wobbling at all. So it's, uh, it's really good for people to, uh, to develop their balance by doing some of these movements. How about, here's a question for you. How about age? of participants what's your current age so i have people from their i've taught kids too but right now currently i have students who are in their 20s all the way through almost 70. okay um, and i to me yoga is a practice you can do throughout your life because like i just demonstrated this is still tree pose mm -hmm. you know you're still doing the pose and i even tell people so what if you come to a wall i've got my hand on the wall i'm still balancing I might just need a little bit more support and a little bit more stability. And you might find over time that, you know, I can pull away from the wall a little bit, you know, but yeah. I, I try to give people those options because I think it's so important to move your body through your whole life. I, I also know that you incorporate um, in your personal routine, a lot of strength training as well, right? So yeah. it's just not, it's just not the flow type motion for stability and mobility, but you incorporate some strength training. So can you just talk a little bit about how you, how you do that? Yeah, so I mean, your, your body weight is only so much. You know, you can only increase the, the intensity of the movement in yoga so much, you know, because your body weight is what it is. But I do a lot of work with kettlebells. Um, I also do some power lifting in the gym. Um, but I find that it's really, really important for me to have several modalities in order to really maintain my body in the best possible way. Um, you know, the stronger I get, the better my yoga practice is. The more fluid my yoga practice is, the better all the other things get. You know, and the yoga particularly gives me a lot more body awareness of how I'm moving. You know, um, so many people don't know where they are in space, you know, yeah. proprioception. They don't yep. know where their body is in space. And to tell them to move a shoulder blade back or to, you know, tuck their tailbone down, it's like they, they don't know. Yep. Um, but through yep. that practice of yoga, you, you become much more aware of where your body physically is in space. Absolutely. So before we wrap up, let's show the, the famous headstand pose. <laughs> well, okay. I'll, do a, I'll do a handstand. I also use a... Um, I do use a bench okay. uh, for my headstand. And because of my, my neck injury, I don't put weight directly on my head. Yep. Um, I use the bench. So I can actually do that. I'll show you the bench that I have. Great. So it's got like a little hole in it. Yep. And it's pretty stable. And I can bring my head and then I'm only putting weight on the tops of my shoulders. And then from here, I just lift up. Great. Which definitely takes core strength. <laughs> it sure does. Tremendous amount of control. Yeah. So yeah. that's awesome. That's <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much for talking to us about your history and your love for yoga and sharing it. How do, how do people get in touch with you? Um, so I'm on Instagram as Joy Magellan. Um, but if you just do a hashtag yoga with joy, you'll find me. <laughs> Yoga with joy. Okay. Hashtag yeah. yoga with joy. Awesome. And then people can sign up for a Zoom class and what do they typically cost? Yeah. So right now it's a $10 drop in for an hour long class. And then I have a couple class packages. They're pretty reasonable. They Wonderful. pay me on Venmo or PayPal and I send them a Zoom link. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, thank you for joining us. And uh, <laughs> thank you for watching uh, You and Your Health. I'm your host, David Bertone. Until the next time, Continue to stay healthy, and uh, we'll see you again. Take a look under your bed. 
find stuff under there? What about jobs? No? Now try your closet. Still no jobs, just more stuff? Well, you really have both. See, stuff is defined as household articles considered as a group. Sometimes this stuff is no longer needed. Wait, no longer needed? That can't be right. Because remember those jobs you were looking for? Those are really needed. And they're the stuff inside your stuff. Our job is to unlock those jobs. And it starts when you donate your stuff to your local Goodwill. Here's how we do it. When you donate to Goodwill, we sell your stuff to provide job training for people right here in your community. So just by teaming up with Goodwill, you help create jobs. And isn't that worth parting with the leftover guitar from your 80s cover band? Goodwill. Donate stuff, create jobs.